Hello and welcome. My name is Mikko Alasarla, and uh, the founder and CEO of Inbot, which is a blockchain AI company based in Berlin, Germany. I have also been speaking in international conferences about two things. Emotionally intelligent AIs, so artificial intelligences that manipulate us, and uh, blockchain AIs. Um, we won with Inbot uh, the global blockchain competition uh, in March in Singapore uh, in the category of blockchain AIs. Uh, so um, it gave a little bit of credibility on my story on the blockchain AIs. Today, I'm going to talk about first how we are heading towards a artificial super intelligence and then how blockchains will help us get there. Super intelligence as a term means an intelligence that is beyond human intelligence. Check this one. And I'll start with uh, one of the world leading experts on super intelligence called Nick Bostrom. Nick Bostrom is a professor at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's, uh, I think, a Swedish born researcher. Uh, who wrote the book, a very popular book about superintelligence, which is, of course, the name of the book as well. And he says this, and this is very important for us to understand, because we humans tend to be proud of ourselves and also think highly about our abilities. Uh, the thing that, that Nick says is that uh, far from being the smartest possible biological species, we just happened to be the first species that was able to create a technological civilization. So we develop ability to communicate with each other via language, and that enabled us to develop skills during our lifetimes. Because uh, before that, the only way we evolved was via the survival of the fittest of the evolution. So, uh, we filled this niche on this planet, and now we are the dominating species. But it doesn't mean that uh, we represent the best possible intelligence out there. Another guy who I also think highly of is uh, a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Um, he invented a lot of things over the years. Uh, he also is the inventor of the concept of singularity which means that, that uh, by merging with technology, uh, it is possible to extend uh, human life to infinity, eventually. I'm not sure if I agree with his notion of the singularity in general, but uh, there's a lot of ideas that he has that a lot of people agree with, including this idea that there's no inherent barriers for us to be able to develop an artificial intelligence that captures all the essential skills that we have. And you know, all the essentials, essential like uh, ideas of uh, uh, how intelligence works and you know, how, how the uh, consciousness works you know, and all the other things that make us intelligent species in general. And it does not have to be the same. It doesn't have to represent the same kind of intelligence that we represent. It's a very important thing to understand. So when you see all this news about AI taking over, let's say, a game of Go, or AI taking over uh, the ability of diagnosing diseases from doctors, or when the AI find, like, is better at analyzing loan papers at the banks, you know, all of these things that are happening, it's very easy for us to settle into this idea that, well, but it doesn't have a consciousness, or well, it doesn't, cannot do this, it cannot do that, and then, therefore, we are better. And, you know, and, and, and the most common way of, uh, of uh, belittling AIs uh, for, for people, especially for those guys who are working on machine learning, is that, hey, I see how my algorithm is working. You know, I just developed this algorithm, I set in the goal, and it achieved the goal, but you know, it only worked in this very narrow realm of the goal that I set that to do. So, for example, if the AI has an ability of uh, discovering pictures of cats from the internet, you know, that was just one of the goals. But one of the things that uh, we don't see necessarily in this, in this picture uh, 
is that there's every single day there are multiple tasks, multiple things that we used to be the best at on this planet that we lose to artificial intelligence. So today, maybe let's say there's a five or six or seven or maybe 25 different things that we were used to be the best at, uh, and now AI is better than us at. And we keep doing that on daily basis for years and years and years and years. All of these AIs are narrow AIs, but as a whole, they start having a skill set, like all of these AIs together have a skill set that is way beyond the human ability. I'm doing this slide to basically show how bad we actually are at, uh, at all of these things that we think we are good at. So if you compare humans with artificial intelligence, uh, starting from the fact that how we ingest information, how we perceive the world, uh, how we interact and so on, um, our hearing, vision and touch, you know, three of the main senses, I mean, there's of course more senses than that, but you know, like those are the ways that we interact with the world, are actually quite limited. You know, we are able to hear only from a short distance. We are able to only see uh, within the visible light spectrum, you know, within a very like, narrow, narrow uh, field of view. Uh, we only can touch with our own body. You know, like, like, so there's, there's all these different things that we only can do in a very sh like, close proximity. And we also are, we learn things, like now that you're listening to me, uh, you're ingesting information at approximately 125 words per minute rate. And that's the ability at which we can ingest new information. It's also the reason why it takes uh, for a human child uh, almost 20 years to develop a skill like uh, via all this education to become a specialist professional at something. Uh, so you go from to the school at six years old and then you come out as a master's degree from the university at maybe 25, or maybe 26, depending on like how long you spend at the university. Uh, it takes a very, very, very long time to educate this person. It's a very expensive process as well. How long does it take for artificial intelligence to develop similar skill set for a specific profession? Once we have the algorithms to do that profession, it will be seconds. So now you start comparing the rate at which our, computer, our computers in our heads are able to ingest information, and you compare that to the processing power of the computers, is it realizing that it's actually not that hard to replicate human skill set and then and improve on it. Also, the fact that we are sporting all of these smartphones all over the world, like I think there's 2.8 billion of them right now on the field, uh, the AIs of the world have access to all of the sensors on them. So all the smartphones have a camera, which is same as vision. They have a microphone, which is same as hearing. And they have a touch screen, which is basically uh, able to interact with people via, via the sense of touch. And, and uh, all of these things, and a lot of them, are actually monitoring us at all times without us knowing. Um, there's plenty of different interested parties in collecting all the information around us, including the telecom carriers, including the phone manufacturers, the operating system makers, the app makers, and so on. Like, it depends on how many app makers you gave the right to listen to your microphone or like, uh, use your camera and so on. Uh, it's a well-known fact that a lot of these bigger app makers like Facebook have been listening for the microphones when you let them do that. Uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of information that is being captured on a daily basis on a global scale uh, via these sensors. And this sensor network for an artificial intelligence that runs in the cloud, let's say that the uh, like AI servers on the Facebook, can practically see the whole world and hear the whole world at the same time. So then you compare that to an individual human. You know, we only communicate via these words, you know, and we are only able to communicate relatively slowly. You know, it's a, it, it, there's no contest. Like, I mean, it's, it's a completely different game that, that we are talking about when, when, when we go to these AIs. Oftentimes, people then say, well, but, you know, AI is just an algorithm. You know, it doesn't have a consciousness. And the consciousness is a uniquely human thing. Well, it, it's not necessarily so. Uh, there's a big question whether consciousness at, at all is even beneficial to us. Uh, according to... Max Tegmark, who wrote a very, very good book called Life 3.0, he's an AI professor at uh, univer like, uh, University of Massachusetts, like uh, MIT, and, and uh, uh, in this book he said that 
The human consciousness evolved because of the evolution that, that, that required that to happen. Uh, but 95% of the time, our consciousness is directing us to the wrong direction. 95% of the time, we are wrong about our analysis of the situation. Why is that? It's because we are biased. And uh, those, those biases that we evolve over the years, like coming from our upbringing, our culture, or anything that we are, like, ingest over these years, is going to cloud our judgment. And this, this bias makes our like, consciousness not necessarily so useful. I mean, of course we have it, but we have to understand that it also has an effect on us. So now, if you want to build an artificial consciousness, you may want to build it a little bit differently. You want to make it into an objective analytics engine for your existing architectural uh, architecture of AIs under it. So if you have machine learning systems for the specific narrow tasks, you just want to build a systemic AI on top of it that analyzes its own doing. You know, and then probably analyzes also uh, its own goals, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, tries to harmonize that across to all these different potentially conflicting goals. We do have the risk, which is very real risk, that the AIs that are starting to reach to this independent status, so you build a, like a complex enough system that it can start making its own decisions, um, there's a risk that it inherits human traits because it's being built by human programmers. And right now, the fact that vast majority of AI developers are male, and mostly even white male, um, there's a huge risk that, that AIs of the future are biased against women, against, against uh, like other cultures. And, you know, so, so we have to be aware of that. It's not necessarily coming from anybody intentionally making a racist AI, but you know, when people are building an AI that looks like themselves, you know, the thinking or the way that it makes decisions will reflect its own creator. In the same way as we want our kids to be like us, you know, it's just like a very common thing for us as parents to think that we want to have kids that behave like us because we kind of think highly about ourselves and, you know, we think that we are making the right decisions. So, so in the same way, the AIs can evolve like that. Of course, it's possible to mitigate that in multiple ways, but, uh, but it's important to understand here that... Uh, Human consciousness is not necessarily such a unique thing that it cannot be reproduced with artificial intelligence. So let's go to the curve. So superintelligence, which means an intelligence that is beyond human intelligence, is already here in many areas. So artificial intelligence can best us in a lot of different tasks. I mean, it can, it's better than us in, for example, diagnosing diseases. It's better than us as playing a game of chess or go. You know, it's better than us in a myriad of other things that are currently out there. Uh, so the question is that when is it better than us in general, like in everything? And uh, uh, now we come into, of course, to some extent, philosophical discussion on when do you think that something is better than us? Because we as humans m are... Like, like behave in a way that Hod Lipson, who is a AI professor at the University of Columbia, I just had the discussion with him at the conference in Germany um, about these narrow AIs coming up. He said that one of the things that we humans have a flaw on is that we think that the super intelligence will emerge as some kind of Frankenstein, like as the one thing that actually is better than us. Uh, and he said that it's, that's not how it will work. How it will work is that we will have a lot of these narrow AIs, so a lot of these small AIs that solve one problem, rising up every day, and every time there's a little bit bigger narrow AI coming up that actually seemingly threatens us, let's say a self-driving car, um, then we say that, yeah, but it's not the same as us people. Like, I mean, it's basically like we keep ignoring it until it's better than us in everything. And you know, it's going to be always the reaction. It's like, yeah, but it's better than, like, we are better than this, and we are better than that. Like, so, so this is the very human reaction of the development of technology. You know, we always find a way of ex excusing ourselves uh, from these different things. So now, if we go in the exponential path of the Moore's Law, and we do not have any hiccups on this process, uh, we will see the superintelligence happening in approximately 2060. Some of us may be even alive at that time. So now, if you 
look at it from that angle, like that's the, basically the path that we own if we do not have any hiccups. What Nick Bostrom says in his book, Super Intelligence, is that we will probably have some hiccups. You know, we will have some situations where we run into problems that cannot be solved with software, you know, and that even if the hardware and, and the infrastructure is enabling us to build a super intelligence, we are just not able to build a, um, like, like a efficient enough systems to, to rep represent that in the software. And, you know, and, and he thinks that the most likely scenario is that, that it will happen somewhere between 2100-2130. I mean, that's still relatively close. I mean, if you look at the whole history of life on Earth and everything else, it's a very, very, very short time frame. And then um, sometimes I ask people who are very skeptical about the AI and, you know, and have this opinion that you know, humans are always better than everything and you know, we are representing the highest level of intelligence in the universe and all kinds of these hub hubris-filled filled ideas of ourselves. Uh, I was like, okay, so do you, think that do you think that the development of technology will stop? And, and uh, uh, the answer is that no, of course it will continue. I said, okay, let's agree that it's continuing at the same rate as it is today. So it slows down from this exponential curve into the same rate as it's doing today. And they say, okay, that's fair. And they say, okay, we will still see super intelligence in 2200 or 2300. Like, so, so we are not talking about very, very long time frames when the super intelligence comes, no matter how we look at it. So yeah, this is the starting point. Uh, so the starting point is that super intelligence is coming. It's coming not as a one big thing, but it's coming in the million of small things. Like every day we have some tasks that go away from humans to the AI until there's no tasks left. 50% of human jobs will be lost way, way, way before we hit super intelligence. Because an average human and the most intelligent human, the difference is quite big. So how we look at these tasks and jobs that we have available, uh, a lot of us are doing jobs that are relatively narrow in scope, you know, doing some things that are not needing a very broad set of creative skills, uh, and all of those jobs are under threat. And people may be thinking that uh, the blue-collar jobs of the, of the factory workers and, you know, and all the other things are the first ones to go, but that's not true. The first ones to go for AI are the ones that do not need any machines. So the AIs that only run on software, so that means the specialist experts working as lawyers and doctors and, and, and accountants and so on. So all of these guys are going to be the first guys to be disrupted by AI. I'll give you an example. There's a company in the United States called Do Not Pay. This is a very interesting example. It's founded by a 21-year-old guy called Joshua Browder. He's the son of Bill Browder, who is a, a founder of Hermitage Capital that has had a little bit of uh, fights with Putin, you know, in the past. You may have seen some lawyers dropping from balconies in, in Moscow and so on, so there has been <laughs> scandals around that. Uh, but this Joshua Browder guy, I mean, interesting name for the company, do not pay. <laughs> so what does it mean? Like, he started from parking tickets. He said, like, let's, let's do an AI, AI lawyer. Uh, Parking tickets are the kind of legal stuff that no lawyer will touch. I mean, there's no value in it. Like, maybe you have to pay like 60 euros, 80 euros, maybe 100 euros, depending on the city. So he said, like, I have an app. You click a button when you have a parking ticket, and you dispute that parking ticket. And, and that's it. You do nothing. It's completely free. You can file a complaint. And he did that in the US. People started getting millions and millions in parking fines back. He actually started winning more than 50% of all of those cases because of the AI lawyer. So uh, over time, it became insanely efficient in fighting parking tickets. Uh, of course, now you think about it, like for the officials, when you have a very, very credible, good AI base, like, like riding on, on contesting all this parking ticket, like you better just like say, okay, uh, fine, I'm gonna ask for the money because it's too much fight for me to work on it. So it's basically like people giving up faster because because the work is too much compared to the value of the fight. Uh, so he won that category. Basically, people say, okay, if I get the parking, I'll just go and press do not pay, and then I don't pay. Uh, what happens next? The guy says, okay, let's go to the small claims. Small claims are basically legal disputes that are so small that, again, most people don't want to use lawyer because the value of the, uh, of the 
this fight is basically less than the lawyer fees, and lawyers want to make a very, very high fees per hour, as you can understand. Um, so yeah, he goes on that and says, okay, file any kind of small claims court in the United States, and we'll fight for you. I mean, our, let our AI lawyer do that for you. It's still free. It's completely free. Now you go and you don't want to fight something on the court, you have an app for that. You press a button and you know, the AI lawyer will file a small claims court filing for you. He keeps winning over 50% of the cases again. Okay, so now we have an app that, that starts winning over half of all the small court claims court actions. That's currently ongoing process. So how do you think it's going to evolve from here? My thinking is, and this is my, of course, my forecast on how that company will evolve, is that the next thing that will happen is that he will go to the middle class cases. Now we are finally at the turf where the lawyers are being used. And, and what's going to happen is that he's most likely going to put the, put the system saying, you know, I'm not asking for any retainers. We are not asking for any fees. The only thing we want is 30% of the outcome, for example. I mean, contingency fee. I mean, how many of these middle class cases will capitulate from the existing human lawyers into AI at this point if the track record of the AI is to win over 50% over of the cases? And it already, by the way, has an insanely massive case database from the existing cases that it already won you know, and it used for the machine learning. So now you start thinking like, okay, it's most likely what's going to happen is that all of these middle class cases will capitulate to AI in no time. And then lawyers will move up on the, on the field into the higher value cases where they're more complex and more hard to understand. Well, by the way, at the same time, the AI is learning about all the possible cases on the middle classes, which is a very, very large amount of uh, potential legal cases that it's going through. It doesn't take a long time for it to keep going up on the pile. Okay, so now, finally, eventually, the lawyers are only representing, the human lawyers are representing in the very most complex cases in something, and everything else is done by AI. That's how it will happen. And this is a pro progression of AI taking over a whole profession piece by piece, starting from the cases which are the least relevant for humans, and then going all the way up to the point that there's no humans needed. And then, then that's how I see a lot of these different industries will go into capital aid to AI. So, so uh, in, in case of doctors, in case of accountants, you know, in case of other things, um, there are regulatory hurdles for this. So there are some existing regulations that require by law, you to use a human to do these things. Of course, that's bad because, because when you have, like, for example, in Germany, there's this thing called notaries. You have, you have the notaries uh, mandated by law for every agreement. What the notaries do is that they read you the agreement aloud, and you have to listen to them reading the agreement, and then they charge you a percentage of the whole deal value that you made, whatever the deal value is. You found a company, GmbH, for example, you pay 1,300 euros for this. It's a legally mandated fee for these guys. You have to sit down for two hours, then listening to them speaking to you, some boring legal crap, and then, then you have to walk away and then you pay them 1,300 euros. It feels incredibly annoying because it's a torture to be there, and if your attention anyhow fades, they, ha they are required to get your attention back. So, <laughs> so you have to be like, watching and listening this, 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 this uh, thing going on for the whole time until it's a whole agreement paper is read through. So now, I mean, of course, in many countries that's not necessary, but you know, when you create this kind of regulations, then you have to go through them no matter what. So now, of course, we have to get rid of those regulations for the AI to take over, but I think uh, AI will take over all of those tasks that we do not regulate away from its reach. And if you look at the data currently available in the world, <laughs> It's been doubling every two years, approximately. So since 2017, uh, and in the beginning of 2019, we will have doubled the whole information available in the whole like, history of the Earth uh, in two years. So if you think about this as a, as a progress in speed, uh, by 2021, we have double the information available that we ever had in the history of the humanity. And if you, if you look at it from that angle, this amount of data is so staggering that there's no way us humans can make any sense of it or uh, like, like try to do anything about it. So we are using increasingly algorithms to go, go through this data and make some, uh, make some predictions for us, also make some um, uh, 
pattern recognition, uh, also like structure and categorize it, make it useful, but it also can make decisions directly from the data as well. So now, having covered the spectrum of the artificial intelligence side of this speech, uh, I'm going to tell you how blockchains can enable these artificial intelligences to become autonomous. So first of all, uh, in order for artificial intelligence to be able to make its own decisions, it will have to have an ability of spending and earning money. Okay? So because spending and earning money in this economic system is, is amounts to being able to make economic decisions by itself. So if you want the AI to be independent, you know, the AI has to be able to control its own wallet. Uh, well, the AI cannot go today to a bank and open a bank account. I mean, it has to be a human who has to do a KYC as a human to this bank account and then control. Of course, it's possible for you to create an AI uh, that this then connects over like APIs to the bank of a human, a human bank account and then try to transact with that. But it actually has a lot of different type of limitations as well as a lot of human processes that cannot be overcome by algorithms very easily uh, that relates to this. So. This is something that can be done with blockchains. So AI can open an account autonomously. It can open as many accounts as it wants you know, in any, any blockchains out there. It's a completely programmatic process. It can also keep its own private keys and other things safe, you know, so it doesn't require any banks or anything. So now you have an ability for an AI to transact financial transactions without any human supervision. This has been actually tried already. Uh, uh, with this, they call the DAOs. You know, you have algorithmic organizations that are uh, basically incentivizing a groups of groups of humans to do things. Uh, but 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 this is basically what can happen with uh, with the blockchains. So now there's uh, four different things that I'm listing here that it become possible for artificial intelligences because of blockchains. One is that that they are able to make contracts, legal contracts with people. I mean, how they are doing going to do that? They're going to program those contracts as smart contracts on the blockchain. So now you, smart contract itself is not a, a legal contract. It's a factory of legal contracts. It's basically a, 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 a script that creates contracts out of it. So every transaction that you do with the smart contract creates a contract between two parties. So, uh, I mean, this is actually what I learned in the, um, uh, like uh, the German uh, um, uh, smart contract uh, uh, event organized by local lawyers. I mean, they're defining what the smart contracts are in Germany now because blockchains are commonly used for lots of things. So smart contracts are not contracts in itself, but they are programs that create contracts. So now these programs can create contracts. So every, every transaction that you do through a smart contract is a, a contract itself, but not the smart contract. It, itself is not. So anyway, but it enables now that you can, as an AI, you can create different type of contracts with different type of parties. Those parties can be machines, they can be people, it doesn't matter. All of this can be done programmatically without any human supervision. Cryptocurrencies enable now the AIs to move money freely for different purposes. So let's say that, that and it, it means that, that the AI can earn money too. So now if you have an artificial intelligence that is very, very good at spotting anomalies between different cryptocurrency exchanges on, let's say, Bitcoin exchange rates on different exchanges and doing buy and, and sell bits, you know, using these arbitrage differences on these different things, it can actually start making itself more money with no human supervision. And if it's very, very efficient at it, you know, it could actually uh, make, like, create a huge, like, uh, cash reserve uh, for spending on other things that are important for the AI, including data. So now, this is another thing that I come is the tokenized APIs. Tokenized APIs are basically programmatic interfaces to different data sources and algorithms that the artificial intelligence can use, uh, where they can spend tokens automatically from itself to earn new skills. So now, if let's say that the AI does not know what's happening in the streets of London, and you know, it wants to now gain access to the, to, the, to the, let's say, CCTV cameras in London to know the food traffic, you know, to, for example, make some financial investments in that, that area. Um, it could tap into an API that offers that for money and spend its like, own money via its own wallets for this purpose, gain access to this data, make a pattern recognition analysis and so on, and then apply this information to, to, for commercial decisions. Um, also, 
blockchain enables AIs to manipulate people in a large scale. So now, if you look at the current scale of um, um, the, uh, the the social and uh, social games, as well as like all the social media out there, uh, it's all basically algorithmic addictions. So all of these companies are really, really incentivized because they make money from addiction. They make money from the fact that, that you spend time on watching YouTube videos or playing games or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, this time is monetized with advertisements, with virtual, virtual goods and so on. And now, these virtual rewards that you get from participating in these things, like in these games, like game, game uh, currencies or like, like likes on the social networks and other things, they are transforming into actual more tangible coins on the cryptocurrency networks. So now if you, if you think about it, now you can use these coins that you earn from different, different sources or this, this artificial intelligence earns to incentivize people for any kind of goals that it wants. So now it creates a reward, for example, on, a, on let's say a Bitcoin reward for doing some thing A or thing B. Let's say that it wants a human to do a task for it that it doesn't cannot do itself, maybe because it needs hands or maybe because it needs some human conversation. Uh, you just create an incentive like a mechanical turkey in Amazon, you just create an incentive on the network and then people will take that incentive and do these things. So now you have an ability for artificial intelligence to mobilize large groups of people. It sounds scary, but it's already happening. I mean, and I'm saying because I'm working on a company, Imbot, which creates virtual cryptocurrency based incentives and rewards for people that are directed by AI. So I'm actually in that space myself. And it's very, very scary to see how easy it is to basically trigger a different type of human behavior with uh, virtual incentives like this. In order for AI to be able to tap into this vast resource of human beings on the planet, uh, they, call, they use something called the human API. I mean, I, the human API in this case is like an, it's a programmable interface to people. And what is that? The human API is this. It's a smartphone which can trigger your attention at any point of time by vibrating in your pocket when the message comes in, by sending a beep sound when the message comes in, by showing a bubble notification on this app and showing this notification on the screens to get your attention. I mean, once you get the attention, then you can direct this human behavior into specific goals by using these virtual currency rewards. The only thing you need to do is to get the attention first, drive them into an application on the phone where they see that, hey, you can earn this much money by doing this, for example. And now you have an API to mobilize a very, very large group of people for any goals that you have in your mind. And, in, and sometimes these rewards do not have to be even monetary rewards. They can be uh, rewards of uh, sense of belonging, social exchange, and so on. Like, there's lots of different rewards that, that drive our human behavior. But all of these are already known by all of these companies out there, like, like the Googles and Facebooks of the world. They already understand how this works, and they are applying it incredibly efficiently in getting our attention and getting our time as an investment. So now you have an artificial intelligence which has its own wallet in, in this vast world of blockchains. And it has the ability of driving be human behavior. It has the ability of making its own decisions. And it has the ability of uh, earning money and spending money. What that, does that make them? They, it makes them autonomous economic agents. So now, once you start having things like this, and this is what I made as a prediction in 2017, I made a prediction that by the end of 2020, we will see the first company that goes from zero to billion in one week. And if you think about this as a speed of which like, you can build like value, uh, it's completely beyond any kind of human comprehension. We cannot understand something like this. And it's so crazy that it's probably going to be decided as a criminal activity or whatever it is, but you know, like, we cannot, because we can't understand it, we will think it's threatening. And if you look at what happened, like what has happened so far, Two of the fastest paths from zero to billion has been done so far in the history of humanity in cryptocurrencies. The first one was Binance, you know, the cryptocurrency exchange, which is currently the largest in the world. Um, they went from zero to billion dollars in six months. And that happened in the, in the course of the last six months of 2017. There was another one, which was now called a criminal activity. 
uh, a Chinese exchange called Fcoin. They invented the new incentive structure called transaction mining. And this transaction mining pulled in people so fast that they bet from zero to billion in two weeks. And they went to zero to 17 billion in exchange volume in, in a matter of less than a month. Uh, after that, the Chinese like uh, government attacked them, and you know I think I think some people went to jail or whatever it happened. But you know, like the thing is that now with the benchmark for this zero to billion is two weeks. So I think by the end of 2020, the one week goal is still possible, and I think I think it uh, looks more likely than not not like likely to happen than not happen. And I'm quite confident that this will happen in the space of cryptocurrencies because of the ability of mobilizing large masses in a completely algorithmic way. And most likely the business that does that is going to be algorithmic in nature. So if you put any humans in the middle, any kind of human negotiation in the middle, the time frames will instantly expand to much, much, much longer. So this is the power of blockchains. And I want to bring into attention at this point uh, because I've been lobbying <laughs> from my location in Germany this uh, cryptocurrency taxation thing in Finland. You know, so Finland, Finnish uh, tax administration decided that, that uh, they want to punish all of the cryptocurrency transactions in the maximum possible way by saying that you cannot deduce your losses. Every transaction, uh, every time the interpretation of the cryptocurrency is made in the worst possible way. So if you are mining cryptocurrency, the currency is a currency at that moment. But when you're spending the currency, it's not the currency. It's, a, it's an asset. Because, because every time they just interpret this cryptocurrency into something that is, the, from taxation perspective, the highest value item for the taxman. So now, having this kind of punitive tax scheme, which is, I think is illegal, but you know, at least it's running, um, uh, is making it impossible for Finnish companies to participate this global public blockchain internet of value. And, and I do think that it's a necessity for any country to be part of this network. No matter what they think now about the history of Bitcoin, I think it doesn't really matter. What matters is that what blockchains really enable us to do, they enable us to have value exchange between people all over the world without any middlemen, without any gatekeepers, without anything that comes in the middle, completely programmatically, if necessary. So now you can have a self-driving car, like they do in Germany. Self-driving car that is tapped into blockchains to be able to transact with different, let's say, pay, uh, fees to the, uh, to the uh, like, uh, paid roads, for example, or be able to pay for charging the car in some, some uh, like, uh, charging station in the city, and so on, without you doing nothing. You just basically sit there, and, you know, and this, all of these transactions are completely automatic and autonomous. So now, this network is so important, in my opinion, that there needs to be public awareness of this topic that, you know, that Finland cannot screw this up so badly that, that they decide to opt out. You know, like, I mean, you cannot be uh, opt opting out from the internet. You know, that's the kind of thing that is happening, in my opinion, right now. It's saying that, let's build our own little pool bond of internet that doesn't have any cryptocurrencies in it, that just has a blockchain, and, you know, and, and the government is going to pay for it, and it's going to be like this small pond for Finnish people and that, that can stay away from the rest of the world. But I think it's, it's a bad decision, so we need to keep talking about it until some of the politicians will understand that this needs to change, and it needs to change fast, because even if Finland wants to be in the forefront of artificial intelligence in the world, uh, they also have to be aware that these AIs that are going to be on the leading edge are going to leverage blockchains for a lot of things because it gives those AIs a lot of autonomy. Coming back to the smart contracts, um, basically, the smart contracts today are made possible by blockchains. So, so in order for you to create contracts that are stored in a way that it is not controlled by any centralized party, where like I can contract with anyone I want, I need to store this contract in the blockchain. I want to store it as a transaction, and it's a hopefully immutable transaction that cannot be mingled with later on. I mean, you can have contracts that are reversible, but it has to be so reversible in a way that there's another transaction that reverses the contract's intent on the, on the second transaction. And when you have it structured like this, you have an ability of scaling any business using completely automatic uh, agreement creation uh, by software uh, between different parties. And this kind of scaling is unprecedented scaling compared to the current world where 
uh, you still have human salespeople like talking to other humans, and then you have a negotiation happening by words, and you know, and then you have some kind of agreement drafted by lawyers, and then you have something to do. It takes a long time to do this. It takes a lot of money to do this, and it all increases inefficiency in the systems. So it's much, much better that we move into this programmable realm where all of this can be done by basically creating some kind of preset uh, rules saying uh, that these contracts can happen within this realm, and then you just let them out and let the algorithms do the thing. And uh, coming back still more and more to these tokenized APIs, so the tokenized APIs are also something that can be only done on blockchains. If you can, of course, have a paid APIs uh, on different services out there, uh, for example, you can use Stripe payments, or you can use use PayPal, or you can use something for paying something on the internet. But that actually currently requires a human account. Again, coming back to this thing that as soon as you require something to be owned by humans and controlled by humans and secured by humans, uh, you lose out the ability of doing completely autonomous growth or autonomous behavior uh, or autonomous economic agents that are beyond the, beyond this human behavior. And I do think that in order for these APIs to work really fast, you need to remove the human negotiations from the, from the angle. So right now, if I want to tap into, uh, let's say, data set from LinkedIn, I need to go and, and meet those people, and I need to negotiate with them, and then they need to agree for their commercial interest to work with me, and then they need to basically draft a contract, and then you have some kind of access to some of the data in some places that they that want. And that's a very, very inefficient way of building things, you know, if you want to have a, a fast data growth. So that's why you need uh, these uh, autonomous agents being able to directly contract via tokenized APIs, via smart contracts that are already having a preset conditions for your access to this data so that it can, it can capture and grow faster. And as a final thing, is this running out of time? Yeah. 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 So, so the, as a final thing, uh, I've created this uh, draft of how you can create a free universal healthcare using AIs and blockchains. So, uh, so this concept basically has an idea that, that you can basically take in money using the human greed and human like these vices as a, as a mechanism of funding this system. So what you do is that you create a health fund that sells services to the existing insurance companies, be it the governmental insurance companies or, or like a private insurance companies on the health side, at the lower cost than they're currently getting from the existing doctor services. And because they are going to make more profit as an insurance company by buying these lower cost services, they're going to be happy to buy these AI powered services from, from this entity. But because this entity doesn't pay any dividends to anyone, it doesn't try to make profit, it just tries to aggregate as big a fund as possible. Um, it will basically be an engine of sucking it all the money from the existing insurance systems and then tokenizing it on the back end and, you know, and then uh, using those tokens for paying for health services for those people who contribute data to the actual AI. So now you can have a mechanism where people are providing like incentivized with uh, autonomous like uh, reward mechanisms to, to contribute disease data as well as their personal health data into the blockchain based database that then is researched and understood and, and pattern recognized and you know, everything is machine learned by AI, uh, which then becomes a better doctor that can then provide better services that can then monetize from the existing insurance systems until the whole existing insurance system is dead. And this is how you can come into a place where everybody can have a free health healthcare service eventually, funded by the existing system originally. And that's the end of it. Thank you for your attention and time.